In this tutorial, we are going to discuss what is OAuth 2 and how to implement OAuth 2 features in Spring Boot applications using Spring Security. We will also have a look at how to implement OAuth 2 patterns for different kinds of applications like server-side rendered applications which are developed using Spring MVC, single page applications which are developed using frameworks like Angular and also have a look at how to implement machine to machine authorization like in the case of microservices. We will use Keycloak as our identity server or authorization server to help us implement these OAuth 2 patterns. If you are not aware of these terms OAuth 2 and identity server don't worry, we will cover everything in this tutorial. So to follow along this tutorial, a basic understanding of Spring Boot and Spring Security is recommended. So without any further delay, let's start the video. So what is OAuth 2? The term OAuth stands for Open Authorization and it's an industry standard protocol that was developed for authorization between services or applications. And this protocol is right now in version 2.0. That's why it's usually known as OAuth 2. Let's understand this better with an example. So I'm a user of a website or mobile application, which is an image gallery application. This application's functionality is simple. The user uploads a photo and can apply different filters and frames around the photo, which he or she uploaded. And we can also print these photos. So now in recent times, Everyone is using cloud services to store images like Google Photos, iCloud or Google Drive. So if you want to access the photos which are stored inside your Google account or maybe Facebook account from this image gallery application, you have to provide permissions for this application to access your Google or Facebook account. You can't just hand over the username and password of your Google or Facebook account to this application because that is very risky as this application can store your credentials to the database and if a hacker gets access to this database, you are in trouble. So we need a safe way to authorize the image gallery application so that it can access our Google or Facebook account. The OAuth framework was developed for this reason. It's a standard way of providing authorization that means, that means permission for a service A, in our case the image gallery application, to access service B, which is a user's Google or Facebook account. When the framework was initially developed, it was just called as OAuth. But later, an updated version 2.0 was released in 2013, so which is called as OAuth 2. Also, as I mentioned before, the A in OAuth stands for authorization, but not authentication, because we are providing authorization for a service to access another service. For this reason, OAuth 2 is also called as delegated authorization. Now, as the OAuth concept is clear, let's zoom in a little bit and see how the actual authorization flow looks like. So we have our user accessing the image gallery application and this application wants to access the photos stored in Google Drive. So instead of asking for Google credentials, the application will redirect us to the login page of Google. And once we log in, we can grant our permissions for the image gallery application to access the Google account thereby the Google Drive account. We can also restrict what all permissions we can give to the image gallery application. In this example, we want the application to only view our photos, but not edit or delete them. Once we grant the permission, the Google server will return a unique access token back to the application. And our application can use this access token to access the photos from our Google account. Once the Google server receives this access token, it verifies whether it's a valid token or not. If it confirms whether it's a valid token, that means a token which is generated by the Google server itself, it will grant access to the photos. In this way, we can only provide limited access to our photos in the Google Drive so that it can just so that the image gallery application can just view our photos but do nothing else. And if required, we can also revoke the access of this application by changing the settings in your Google account. So this is a high level overview of how the OAuth protocol works. In the next section, we'll have a look at commonly used OAuth terminology to understand this better. So we saw on a high level how OAuth works, but to implement OAuth and understand different kinds of OAuth flows, you need to get familiarized with different types of OAuth terminology. The first one is called as a resource or a protected resource. In our image gallery application example, we saw earlier the resource or a protected resource is the image or photos stored inside our Google Drive account. So anything which needs to be accessed by an external service and which needs the authorization to access it is called as a resource. The next term is called as a resource owner. As the name suggests, this means the owner of the resource. In this case, it would be me or you, the person who is the owner of the photos. The next term is called resource server. 
So this is the server that stores or hosts the resource. In our case, it's the Google Drive server that stores our photos. The next term is called a client, which is the service or application which is accessing the resource. In our case, it's the image gallery application. So this client can be a web, mobile, desktop application, or it can be a standalone service like a microservice or even a device like a smart TV. So we also have a couple of categories in clients. A client can be a public client, which means a mobile application or a web or desktop application. And the other type of category is a confidential client. So this can be a microservice or a cron job running on a remote server. So for each client, we have different kinds of authorization flows, also called grant types, which means for different kinds of client, we have different ways or mechanisms to get the access tokens. We will discuss this also in details in the coming sections. So the last term we are going to have a look is the authorization server. So this is the server that will generate and provide access tokens to the client and will also verify whether an access token is valid or not. There are many options available for the authorization server in the market. So you have Amazon's AWS Cognito, Google's Identity Platform and Okta as the famous authorization servers. If you want to manage the authorization on your own, Keycloak is a very good option. It's an open source offering and in this tutorial we will mainly see how to implement OAuth2 patterns using Keycloak. Finally, Spring Framework is working on its own authorization server offering which is still in early stages at the time of creating these videos. So if this project, if so if you are interested, this project is something you have to track. So as you understood what is OAuth2, you also need to know something called as OIDC also known as OpenID Connect. This is a protocol which is built on top of OAuth2 which mainly acts as an identity layer. So what do I mean by identity layer? So previously we saw that when the client wants to access a resource like your photos on Google Drive, it needs an access token from the authorization server. This access token is basically a random alphanumerical set of characters which basically does not provide any context or information about the user. So which makes it hard for the clients to understand and get the user information. For this reason, the identity layer will send an additional token called an ID token which contains basic information about the user like email, first name and last name. So when the user requests a token, he or she will receive now will now receive two tokens as part of OpenID Connect. One is an access token and the other one is an ID token. The access token will be used to verify whether the user contains necessary permissions to access the user or not and the ID token will be used to verify the user information itself. So this is the main difference between OAuth2 and OpenID Connect. In the later chapters, we will also have a look at how this ID token and the access token looks like so you can understand it much better. So for now, let's move on to the next topic. So as I said before, we are going to use the Keycloak authorization server in this tutorial. And if you are not already aware of Keycloak, Keycloak is an open source identity and access management server. It's a very popular and widely used authorization server in the industry. To get started with Keycloak, you can download it by going to the downloads page. You can either select a standalone installation or a Docker download. I'm going to go ahead with the standard installation and I already downloaded the Keycloak software to my machine. So once you download Keycloak, uh, you have to unzip and open the bin folder in the terminal. And to start the Keycloak server, you have to type the command standalone.bat minus d jboss.http.port equals 8180. So Keycloak by default uses the server 8080, but as we are, as we'll be running our Spring Boot application on the port 8080, I want to start the Keycloak server on the port 8180. So when you run this command, Keycloak will start on the port 8180. Once the server is up and running, open the browser and go to the address http localhost 8180. You'll be asked to create an initial admin user account to get started and access the server. Just provide a username and password of your choice and click on the create button. Once the user is created, we can log in to our authorization server by clicking on the administration console option and now you can see the login page. I'm going to type in my admin account credentials and click on login. So now you can see that I'm logged in to the admin console and the first thing you will observe is something called as a master. Something called a master which is the default realm in Keycloak. So a realm is like a placeholder where you can manage a set of clients, users and their roles. So each realm is not create, is not connected with each other. So if I create a user in one realm, they are not available or accessible from another realm. Okay, so the first thing we are going to do now is to create our own realm 
by clicking on add realm button. Here I will provide a name to the realm and click on create button. So now you can see that the realm is created and activated automatically. Now I can create as many clients under this realm and also as many users and role I want under this realm. So now let's go ahead and create a client. This client is going to be a Spring MVC application which is developed using Thymeleaf. So this is going to be a server side Spring MVC application. So to create this client, I'm going to click on client section and click on create. This will bring up an add client page. In here, I have to provide the client ID. I'm going to provide this as OAuth demo Thymeleaf client and click on save. So if you remember, we discussed a while ago when we register our client with the authorization server, we'll get a client ID and client secret. So this is the client ID we received already. And now you can see that we see much more details inside the client page. The first one you can see is the client protocol. This we are going to leave it as OpenID Connect. Next, we have the access type. This is also the client type we discussed some time back. It can either be public, confidential or bearer only. As we are now dealing with a server side rendered Spring MVC application, I'm going to choose the client type as confidential and I'm going to leave the standard flow enabled option as on because this is also called as authorization code flow and that's what we want to implement as part of this demo. And the next field we are interested in is the valid redirect URI. This will be the redirect URI which the authorization server will use to send us the authorization code as we saw earlier. So for this field, I'm going to provide the value HTTP localhost 8080 slash login slash OAuth2 slash code slash OAuth2 code demo timelift client. So which is the client ID which we have provided before. So this is the default redirect URI which Spring Boot supports and which is also according to the OAuth2 conventions. So this is recognized by our Spring MSC application. You don't need to implement this endpoint. Spring will automatically handle the request when Keycloak will redirect to this particular URI. So that's all we need to do. Now we can click on save. Okay, now we have to do one last thing inside the client page that is to generate a client secret. We can do that by clicking on the credentials tab. The client secret was already generated for us. So if you need, we can gen regenerate the secret and we will come back to this once we configured our Spring MVC application. And also we have to create a user so that we can log into our application. We can do that by clicking on the user section on the left side. So here we can view all users and also add a new user. I'm going to click on add new user and here I'm going to type the username and click on save. This will create the user successfully and to set a password, I'm going to click on the credentials tab and in here I'm going to provide a random password. Here we also have the option to select whether the password is going to be a temporary password or not. If you select this option, the very first time you log in, it will ask you to change the password. So let's leave this option on and click on OK and set password. Okay, so we installed Keycloak, configured admin credentials, created a realm, a client and a user. So that's all we need to do. Now let's go ahead and implement our demo application. All right, now let's see how the authorization code flow works in practice. We're going to develop a Spring MVC application to implement authorization code flow. I already have the finished application ready and running. So what I'm going to do right now is open a browser window and open the browser tools in this and the network tab. In this way, we can see the network calls our application is going to make. So I'm going to open the URL HTTP localhost 8080 slash home. As soon as I press enter, you can see that an initial authorization request is triggered by the browser to the endpoint to authorize. And If you check the request parameters, we have a response type as code, a state parameter and a redirect URI. So the Keycloak server will make a request to this redirect URI after the successful authentication along with the authorization code. We'll have a look at it shortly. And lastly, we also have the client ID as one of the request parameter. So as soon as the Keycloak server received this request, it responds with a login page. So I'm going to provide the credentials of the user I created in the previous section. And observe carefully here, right after I click on login, you can see that we now have a call to the redirect URI, as I mentioned before. And if you look at the query string parameters, you can see the parameters state, session state, 
and the important parameter code. So this is the authorization code our application will use to request the token. Now as this is a server side rendered application, I cannot show you how I cannot show you the call to the token endpoint as it is done in the background by our Spring Boot application. However, I'm going to add a breakpoint to the class OIDC authorization code authentication provider inside the authenticate method. You will see how to access the source code shortly after the demo. So let's continue and refresh our page in the browser. And now you can see that the execution has paused at the breakpoint. And if we observe the variables, we have a variable called access token response and ID token, where we can see the values for access token and ID token. And if we observe the claims section of the ID token, we can find the user information here, as I mentioned before. So the user information like username and uh, also email. I didn't provide the email here, but if we provide the email when creating the user, you can also see that information in here. So we can also see the token value of the ID token. So this is the demo part. Now let's go ahead to the more interesting section that is for the implementation. For that, the first thing you have to do is to download the starter code. You can find the link to the source code in the description section of this video. And once you open the GitHub code, you can check out the code and switch to the branch name initial. So this branch contains the starter template for this tutorial. So we can get started right away and we don't need to spend time in setting up the initial project. So once you check out the code, make sure you run the class demo application. It should be starting without any errors. So now let's set up the application. The first thing we are going to do is to add the OAuth2 dependency to our Spring Boot application. I'm going to open the pom.xml file and under the dependency section, I'm going to add the dependency Spring Boot Starter OAuth2 Client. After adding this annotation, make sure to refresh the Maven configuration by clicking on the icon to the top right side corner if you're using IntelliJ. So if you love, if you now have a look at the pom.xml, we have dependencies for Spring Web, which will activate the Spring MVC module in our project, and also the Timelift Starter, which will enable the Timelift features. And the last dependency is for testing, which we are not going to cover as part of this tutorial. However, if you are interested, I covered this part already in my channel through a, a practical example. So you can, you can have a look at the playlist in the description section. Now our Spring Boot application is ready to be configured with the OAuth2 capabilities. So the first thing I'm going to do is to create a package called as controller under the root project. And under this package, now I'm going to create a class called as home controller. This is going to be the controller which will serve our initial request to the application. Above the class, I'm going to add the controller annotation. And inside the class, I'm going to create a method called as home, which contains the written type as string. And inside the method, I'm going to return the string called home. This is going to be the name of the HTML file, which is going to serve the request. No surprises here, it's pretty straightforward Spring MVC code. And lastly, I'm going to add the get mapping annotation to the method with the value as home. So whenever the browser sends a request to the server with the request mapping home, it will redirect the request to the home.html page. Now let's go to the resources folder and here I'm going to create the home.html file under the template section. And this is going to be uh, just a boring HTML file Nothing special here. I'm going to add a h1 tag with some welcome message inside the body tag. Okay, so next we are going to configure the OAuth2 client properties inside our Spring Boot application. For that, I'm going to open the application.properties file and I'm going to type spring.security.oauth2.client.registration followed by a registration key I'm going to provide the same name as the client ID we gave before, OAuth2 demo timelift client. So you don't need to provide this exact name. You can give any name you like. And I'm going to add the property key client ID. The value of this property is going to be the client ID of the client we created in the previous section. The next property is going to be client secret. So I'm going to copy the whole property. I'm going to copy the client secret from the key clock server and copy it inside the application.properties file. If needed, you can regenerate this client secret. And uh, the next property is going to be scope. Here you can define different scopes and roles if you want to deal with roles in your application. By default, we are going to have the scope as open ID, profile and roles. The next property is going to be the type of authorization grant type. 
which is authorization code which is the present example we are dealing with so followed by the property redirect uri as i mentioned before this is the url which our keycloak server will call when the authentication is successful we don't need to implement any logic to handle the redirect spring boot security will do this for us out of the box and also this redirect uri is defined according to the oauth2 specifications so all the magic will be done by spring security here and lastly we have to provide the property called issuer uri this value you can find it by by going to the keycloak url open your realm settings and click on the endpoint open id configuration here you can see all the urls which belong to our realm and uh, which are defined as part of the as part of the oauth2 conventions so we have the endpoint to start the authorization flow and the endpoint to get the token for this reason instead of adding all these values one by one we can provide only the issuer uri to spring boot and it can refer to this endpoint to make any calls uh, that it needs so if it needs to request a token it can call the token endpoint and if it needs to verify the token it can call the introspection endpoint and if it needs to get the user info it will call the user info endpoint and so on and so forth so i'm going to copy this value and paste it inside the application.properties file so that's all we need to do to configure the oauth2 client properties in our spring boot application so we provided all the necessary information now let's start our server and open the url http localhost 8080 home again so you should be redirected to the keycloak login page i'm going to type in my credentials and log in and now you can see that the program execution is paused at the breakpoint i added before if not add the breakpoint inside the authenticate method and refresh your browser back to your ide you can see the values for the access token and id token inside the the debug section so pkc authorized code flow spelled as pixie authorization code flow stands for proof of key code exchange authorization this grant type was created to be used for public facing clients for example web applications which are developed using javascript frameworks like angular react or vue and also mobile applications the pixie authorization code flow is mainly considered as a best practice to follow when we are using public clients the main reason for using these kinds of uh, different authorization code flow is because if you remember as part of the authorization code flow we saw previously that to get the access token an id token pair from the authorization server the client needs to make a post request with the client id client secret and the authorization code so that means we have to store the client secret somewhere in the client to be able to make a post call for the token endpoint this is very risky because any web developer can view the source code of the javascript applications and find the client secret if we store it in the client so the same also applies for the mobile application so if you have the apk file and uh, you can decompile or uh, decrypt decompile that apk file to view the source code so it's not safe at all to store the client secret inside the client source code so for this reason a new type of authorization code flow was designed which is the pixie um, which is the pixie enhanced authorization code flow this flow is very similar to the authorization code flow but with a couple of additional steps and also there is also no need to maintain the client secret anymore in the client by using this approach as i said before so let's see let's so let's go ahead and see how it looks like in the pixie authorization code flow similar to authorization code flow we will make an initial request to the authorized endpoint of the keycloak server with some query parameters parameters we are sending are almost similar to what we sent as part of the authorization code flow so if you need to understand why we need these parameters have a look at part 1 of this video i am not going to repeat this information again so as part of the pixie authorization code flow we are going to send two additional url parameters the first one is called as code challenge which is a base64 encoded random string which is generated by hashing and encoding another value generated by the client called as code verifier the next parameter is called as code challenge method which should be configured inside our authorization server when we are first configuring the client the recommended value for this code challenge method parameter is s256 which is a cryptographic hashing function once the client make this request to the authorization server the server responds with a login page asking for the user to authenticate once the user logs in the authorization server returns an authorization code similar to the authorization code flow we saw in part 1 of the series but now to request an access token the client should send the code verifier value 
along with the authorization code as part of the post request to the token endpoint. When the authorization server receives this post request, it validates the authorization code and the code verifier values and then responds with an access token and ID token pair. Once the client gets this token, it can now make the request to access the resource to the resource server and the resource server will first validate whether the token is valid or not. So this is how the Pixie authorization code flow works. Hope you have understood this theory. Now let's see this grant flow in practice and then implement it using Spring Boot and an Angular application. Okay, so now let's see the Pixie authorization code flow grant type in practice. For this, I already started the front end and back end applications and in the browser, I have the network tab open and uh, I'm going to hit the endpoint localhost 4200 and in here, you can see the link login. If I click on it, you can see similar to the authorization code grant type we had the we have the initial authorization request to the keyclock server which returns a login page if you check the parameters which are part of the authorization request you can see the response type as code the client id and a state parameter the additional parameter added to this request url is the code challenge and code challenge method these values are generated by our angular application and the keyclock server responded with a login page for this request now let's go ahead and log in I'm going to type in my credentials and click on the login button. Now you can see the request which is made to the redirect URI. If you check the query string parameters again, we see the same query parameters as the previous authorization code flow. We have the state parameter, the state session and code. Our Angular application will use this code to make a post request to the token endpoint as this is a public Angular application. So if we have a look at this request, it goes by the name token. So it's easy to identify and as I mentioned before, this will be a POST request with the request body as the authorization grant type, the authorization code, the redirect URI and client ID. Lastly, we have a new parameter called code verifier. This value is used to verify the code challenge method, the code, the value code challenge, just as explained in the previous section. Now, if you check the response of this call, you can see the value for the access token, the expiry time of this token followed by the refresh token and its expiry time. So if our client needs to make any calls to a resource server, it can make use of this access token. And if the client, and if the access token is expired, it can use the refresh token to request a new access token. Now this is how the Pixie authorized code flow works. So let's go ahead and see how to implement this grant type. Okay, so first of all, we are going to start by creating a client inside Keycloak. For that, make sure you have the Keycloak server up and running and open the address localhost 8180 and log in with your admin credentials. Now, if you click on the clients tab and click on create button, we are going to provide the client ID as OAuth2 demo pixie client and click on save. And now here we have to make some changes. First of all, we have to select the access type as public as we are using a pixie enhanced authorization code flow for the JavaScript kind for the JavaScript client applications. So we will leave the standard flow enabled as on as it's also called as authorization code flow. We will leave also the following options as defaults and we have to provide the value for valid redirect URI. So this is the URI where the authorization server will send the authorization code and the client reads the code. So I'm going to provide here the value localhost 4200 which is the address of the Angular application. The next value we have to provide is for the web origins. So this would be the allowed course origins which can access the authorization server. So we are going to provide a star here as we are going to permit all origins. So when you are using this for production applications, please don't provide a star value here and only provide the valid origin of the redirect URI you are going to use. So that means if your front end application is running on a server, provide the host details of the server instead of allowing all origins. All right, so the next value we are going to configure is the pixie enhanced code challenge method. You can find this value under the advanced settings and I'm going to select the value as S256, which is a cryptographic hashing function, which will be applied on the code verifier value. So if you select plain, there won't be any hashing performed on the code verifier and this is not a secured option and this is highly discouraged. So that's it for the client configuration. I'm going to click on save. So now let's go ahead and dive into the code. So similar to part one of this video, you can download the starter code from the GitHub repo. You can find the repository in the description section of this video. So the main branch contains the completed code and the starter code is provided in the initial branch. 
So if you are stuck for any reason, you can refer to the completed code in the main branch. So in this video, we are mainly interested in the Pixie authorization code flow. So once you open the OAuth2 Pixie demo project, under the source main resources folder, you will see a folder called frontend which contains the code for the Angular application. So the first thing we are going to do is to install a package called Angular OAuth2 OIDC inside our Angular application. This package will provide OAuth2 capabilities for our Angular application by just writing some minimal code. So this package supports both authorization code flow and Pixie enhanced authorization code flow. So let's go ahead and add these details inside the package.json file. So at the time of creating this video, the Angular OAuth2 OIDC package is on version 10.0.3. So once you have added this dependency, run npm install to download and install the package to your machine. Okay, now we have to configure the client details inside the application. For that, I'm going to create a new file called auth.config.ts inside the app folder. And inside this file, I'm going to define an object called auth.config, which is of type auth.config coming from the Angular OAuth2 OIDC library. So I'm going to type export const auth.config and declare the return type of the object. And inside the object, I'm going to define six fields. The first one is going to be the issuer URI. So if you have watched the part one, I already discussed what is issuer URI in detail. So please have a look at this video if you didn't watch it yet. So this issuer URI contains all the list of configuration endpoints, which is exposed by the authorization server. So you saw in the theory part that our client is going to make multiple calls to the authorization server. The first one is the initial authorized request and followed by the token endpoint request. And subsequently, it will also make a request to refresh the token if needed. So instead of hard coding all the endpoints in the application, you can just provide the issuer URI, which will expose the list of endpoints. And then the client can use this list of endpoints and call, and call whatever uh, endpoint is required. Okay, the next value is going to be redirect URI. This is the same value we provided when configuring the client in the previous section. So instead of hard coding this value inside our code, we can provide the JavaScript window object like window.location.origin, which will return the address of the web application. The next value is going to be the client ID, which is OAuth2 demo pixie client. Again, we have to provide the same value as we provide inside the client. So it's better to copy this value from the client information in Keycloak and paste it here. The next value is going to be response type. This is going to be code as we are following authorization code flow mechanism. Even if it's pixie enhanced, we provide the value as code itself. So the next value is going to be strict discovery document validation. So this is something which is relevant to this Angular OAuth2 OIDC library. So we are going to provide it as true. So this is used when the list of endpoints exposed by the issuer URI endpoint does not contain the same base URI as the issuer endpoint. So what do I mean by that? So if I open the open ID configuration of our realm, you can see that by visiting the realm page inside our Keycloak server and click on open ID configuration link, you can see that the base URL of all the URLs are same because we are using Keycloak as the authorization server, it is going to be consistent. So if for any reason we anticipate the base URL is not going to be consistent, across all these URLs, then we'll provide the value as false. So in those cases, our application will not validate the discovery document, that is the JSON we are seeing, we are seeing here for the base URLs. All right, moving ahead, we have the last parameter called scope. Here I'm going to provide some default scopes like open ID, profile, email, and offline access. After configuring these values, now let's implement the flow. It's very easy. I'm going to open the app component HTML page and remove all the default HTML which exists inside the file. And I'm going to replace it with just some bare bone HTML code. So I'm going to add an anchor tag with text called login and another anchor tag with text logout. So if I click on this link in the browser, it should make the authorized call to the authorization server as seen in the theory, which is step one. So to do that, I'm going to make use of the out of the box functionality provided by the Angular OAuth2 OIDC package. So I'm going to first inject the OAuth service class into the component, which is coming in from the library. Make sure to import the class into the component. And after injecting the service, 
we should provide the auth config details to the service. We can do that by first creating a method called as configure. So let's define and create this method. And inside the method, I'm going to type this dot auth service dot configure and pass in the auth config object as the argument. Also, make sure to import this object into the component. Now I'm going to type this dot auth service dot load discovery document and try login. So what this method call will do is to make a call to the issuer URI and get all the necessary endpoint required to trigger the login flow. Okay, now we are ready to trigger the login flow. For that, we can make use of the convenience methods provided by the Angular auth2 OIDC package. For that, I'm going to create two methods, login and logout. So first, inside the login method, I'm going to type this dot auth service dot init code flow, which will kick off the authorization code flow. And inside the logout method, I'm going to type this dot auth service dot logout which will take care of logging out of the application automatically. So you see how it is, how easy it is to implement authentication and authorization using this library. So it makes our life easier as the developers. And if you want to implement it manually, so it's going to take lots of time and effort to do it. So due to this flexibility provided by the libraries, it's important for us developers to do due diligence and understand how it's working under the hood. So that's where the videos like this are going to help you. So if you like it so far, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel to make uh, to check out more interesting tutorials like this. All right, now let's come back to our tutorial. So we configured the required methods inside the app component TypeScript file, but we are not yet calling these methods from our HTML file. So let's open the app component HTML and call the login and logout methods when clicking on this link. So I'm going to use the click directive and pass in the login and logout methods method uh, definitions there. So now if I click on the login link from the browser, it should kick off the Pixie authorization code flow mechanism. All right, now let's start up our Angular application. For that, I'm going to type npm start in the terminal and make sure you are in the front end directory. And once the application is started up, open localhost 4200. So now you can see that we don't see any um, any links here, any hyperlinks with login or logout because we have an error because the OAuth service is not understandable by the Angular modules for our Angular application. This is because we have to define the OAuth module inside the op mod, app modules.ts file. So I'm going to open the app module.ts file and in there I'm going to inside under the import section, I'm going to type OAuth module dot for root and inside here inside the configuration section I'm going to provide the object for resource server and inside there I'm going to provide what are the allowed URLs for the resources server. So this is going to be HTTP localhost 8080 slash API. We did not yet create the resource server but we will do it shortly. You will have a look at it shortly. And the second um, and the second variable is going to be send access token true. So we are also going to see in detail like what does actually this mean, this particular variable and uh, declaration means. So now as we've done that, uh, we will also define the HTTP client module because we will make a call to the resource server and we need uh, access for the HTTP client to make a get request. So in this way, we are covered also for the HTTP client module to be accessed from our Angular application. So once you've done that, uh, you can restart the Angular application and uh, open the browser again, the localhost 4200 and refresh the page. And now you can see two text values, login and logout. And I'm going to first open the dev tools and network tab. So you can see the network calls while logging into the application. Click on the link login, it will open the login page. And as part of the first request, you can see the value code challenge, which is generated by the Angular over to OIDC package. And we are also sending the code challenge method as S256, which is the same value as we configured inside the Keycloak uh, client. So the rest of the query parameters are similar to the authorization code flow. And uh, coming back to the browser window, I'm going to type in my credentials, which I created in part one of this series. And once I click on login, and if we check the network tab inside the dev tools again, you can see that it made the call to authenticate followed by the open ID configuration call. So this is the discovery document, which is returned by the authorization server. 
So if you see the response, you can see all the information we saw before here. And uh, the client will make use of this data to make a token endpoint post call to the authorization server. So you can see that also, you can also see that it sent the grant type as code, the authorization code it received from the key cloak, the redirect URI, the code verifier, which is generated by the Angular OAuth 2 OIDC package and the client ID. So once the Keycloak server receives this request, it will decode the code challenge value provided as part of the initial request. So you can see here in the diagram in step one, using the S256 cryptographic hashing function and verifies whether it's same as the code verifier or not. If yes, then it will respond with access token and ID token. And uh, the token value is stored inside the session storage by default as I'm using an, in an incognito window. So you can use this access token to request the resource server and access the protected resource. So this is how we implement Pixie authorization code flow on the client side. Now let's implement the resource server part. So if you go back to the source code, we have our Spring Boot application, which just contains a main class as of now. So to configure the resource server, we have to first add some dependencies to enable OAuth 2 resource server capabilities. For that, I'm going to open the pom.xml and add in three dependencies. The first one is going to be Spring Boot Starter OAuth 2 Resource Server, which will enable the resource server capabilities inside our Spring Boot application, followed by Spring Security OAuth 2 Jose dependency, which will also enable the JavaScript object signing and encryption framework, shortly called as Jose framework, which is used to securely transfer claims between two parties. This means transferring the JSON web tokens the JSON web signatures, JSON web encryption and JSON web keys. So I'm not going to go over this in details, but in a nutshell, it makes sure that the keys and tokens are transferred sec securely between two parties. Lastly, I'm also going to enable Spring security in this project using the Spring Boot starter security dependency. After adding all these dependencies, if you are using IntelliJ as your ID, Make sure to click on the Maven icon on the top right corner to force IntelliJ to download the dependencies. Now it's time to configure the resource server properties. For that, I'm going to open the application.properties file and define a property spring.security.oauthtrue.resourceserver.jwt.jwtseturi. So this is the property which will point to the key set URI of key cloak which is used to verify the access token and ID token we receive from the client. Here you can see this in the diagram in step seven and eight. For this, I'm going to open the open ID configuration of the key clock server by opening the realm and clicking on the open ID configuration link. And I'm going to copy the value for JWKS URI and paste it inside the file. Okay, we have configured the resource server. Now let's create an endpoint to act as a resource. For that, I'm going to create a package called as controller and inside the package, I'm going to create a class called as home rest controller. As this is going to be a rest controller, I'm going to add the rest controller annotation from Spring MVC followed by the request mapping. I'm going to expose the endpoint at slash API slash home and I'm going to also configure the cross variations annotation with value as star. So inside the class, I'm going to create a method called as home, which returns a string. And inside this method, I'm going to return a string called hello. As this is going to handle a get request, I'm going to add the get mapping annotation followed by the response status annotation with value as okay. All right, we configured also the endpoint. And the last thing which is remaining is to configure also the spring security. For that, I'm going to create another package called config. And inside this package, I'm going to create a class called as security config. This class should extend the web security configurer adapter. So in this way, it will override the default spring security configurations, which are defined by the framework. And I'm going to add the configuration annotation on top of the class. I'm going to override the configuration method here. And inside the method, we can customize how spring security should behave. So first of all, I'm going to make sure that all requests to our resource server should be authorized first. So I can do that by chaining the authorized request dot and request dot authenticated method followed by the session management and session creation policy as this is going to be a rest backend. It should be stateless. 
And finally, we are going to add the course annotation to inform Spring Security that it will be taken care by the cross origin annotation we added uh, a moment ago. And lastly, I'm going to disable CSRF and configure the resource server and JWT token capabilities inside our Spring Security framework. So we are chaining so many calls here, but that's how Spring Security configuration works. And uh, so we are done with the backend configuration. We enabled resource server capabilities and created an endpoint. Now let's go back to the Angular application and make a request to the resource server after successful login. All right, so now I'm inside the Angular application, inside the terminal. I am going to first create a service class which contains logic to make calls to our resource server. For that, I am going to type ng gs app which is going to create a class called as app service dot ts and app service dot spec dot ts files. We are only interested in the app service dot ts file right now, so I am going to open this file and in here we have to make a HTTP GET request to our resource server. For that, I'm going to first inject the HTTP client into the service. And after that, I'm going to create a method called as hello, which will return an observable of string as we are returning a string as a response from our backend. Inside the method, I'm going to first define HTTP headers by setting the content type as text or plain. The reason being, as I mentioned, we are, set, we are returning a string as a response. Now I'm going to make the get call using the HTTP client to the URL localhost 8080 slash API slash home. And now we are going to pass in the headers as the next argument for the get method. So when the HTTP client makes a get call to this URL, it will include these headers and also make sure to add the written statement so that it will return the observable. So we implemented the service call. So what is remaining now is to call the service from our component. So for that, I'm going to open the app component TypeScript file. And in here, the first thing I'm going to do is to inject the app service class. And inside the constructor, I'm going to call the hello method from the app service and subscribe to the observable returned by the method. Inside the subscribe method, I'm going to read the response and assign it to a variable called text. Let's store this subscription inside a variable called hello subscription, which is of type subscription. And we have to unsubscribe from the subscription when the component is destroyed. So for that, I'm going to implement on destroy interface for this component. And inside the ng on destroy method, I'm going to type this dot hello subscription dot unsubscribe. This will make sure that there are no active subscriptions lying around, which can cause memory leaks in the application if not given sufficient attention. All right, the last and final thing we are going to do is to bind this variable to our HTML page. So for that, I'm going to add in a H1 tag and bind the text variable as I don't want to write much code and keep this video relevant to OAuth 2 and Keycloak. To display the response from server, we have to refresh the browser after the login. So I'm going to add in the message also here. Okay, so we completed the implementation part on the front end as well as the back end. Now let's start our front-end application by typing npm start and make sure that the backend Spring Boot app is also up and running. All right, now let's open an incognito window and open the address localhost 4200 and click on login. Now I'm going to type in my credentials and after clicking on login, you can see the home page. So let's refresh the page and you can see the response from the backend as hello. Now you may ask how did our Angular application recognize the token and send it part of the request to the resource server automatically. So this is done by the Angular OAuth 2 OIDC library automatically. So that is one less thing for us to care as uh, the developers. The client credentials grant flow is mainly used for machine to machine in authorization, which means if the client is a CLI application or a shell script running on a remote server or even a Spring Boot microservice, it doesn't make sense to use a standard username password combination with the login page like how we implemented in the first two parts of this series using the authorization code code flow grant type or pixie enhanced authorization code flow grant type for this reason when using this flow the clients will directly make a post request to the authorization server with grant type as client credentials and it will also include the client id and client secret 
to authenticate themselves with the authorization server. The authorization server will validate the credentials and if they are valid, will generate an access token and sends it back to the client. When the client needs to access the protected resource, similar to the other grant types, it will include the access token as part of the request header and then the resource server will verify the validity of the token by sending the access token to the authorization server. You may have already observed the client credential flow is significantly simpler compared to the other two authorization code flows. That's because uh, of the confidentiality which is involved uh, based on the client. So now let's go ahead and see a demo on how to implement this grant type. So I have a Spring Boot application up and running already and now I open a REST client like Postman to make a POST call to request the token from the authorization server. So here is the endpoint to which we are making the request. You can get this endpoint by opening the Realm settings inside Keycloak and clicking on the OpenID configuration link and by copying the token endpoint from the JSON. Back to the Postman client as part of the POST request, I am passing the request body with the first field as grant type which is going to be client credentials followed by the field client ID. I am going to provide the client ID as OAuth2 client credentials. I already created a client inside Keycloak with this client ID. I will show you how to create this client also shortly. The next field is client secret which is an auto generated secret by the Keycloak server. So now if I click on send, you can see that we received the access token and a refresh token and we can now use this access token to make a request to our resource server. Okay, I hope you understood how we can request a token from the authorization server through this demo. Now let's go ahead and see how to implement the client credentials grant flow in a Spring Boot application. Okay, as a first step, we have to create a client inside Keycloak which can access the authorization server through the client credentials grant flow. For that, I'm going to open our realm we created before and click on clients tab to the left side of the screen and click on create. The client name I'm going to type in is auth2 underscore auth2 client credentials and click on save. After you clicked on save, you can see some more details about the client. We don't need to care about that. But the first thing we are going to do is to change the access type of the client to confidential. As we are implementing client credential flow, the client is usually not available for public and it is because usually the client is running on a remote, remote server somewhere. So hence the reason why we are choosing the option confidential. After that, just click on save and now you will see the credentials tab. If you click on it, we can see a client secret which is generated already for us. Just copy this value, we will use it in our Spring Boot application later. So we completed the Keycloak configuration part. Now let's go ahead and implement the Spring Boot configuration part. For that, I'm going to open our initial starter project on GitHub. So you can download this project from the GitHub link in the description section. And make sure you are on the initial branch to code along and follow the tutorial. So in this part, we are going to mainly focus on the OAuth2 client credentials demo project. If you expand it, you can see two projects inside the main project, the microservice one and two. For now, to implement the client credentials demo, we will start working on the microservice one project. Then later in the video, we will see how to bring microservice two into picture. Okay, so I'm going to open the pom.xml file of the microservice one project. And inside this file, I'm going to add four dependencies in here. The first one is going to be Spring Boot Starter OAuth2 Client, which will enable the OAuth2 Client functionality for our project. In this case, we don't have any JavaScript application which will act as the client. In the previous Pixie authorization code flow example, we have the Angular application as the client and the Spring Boot application as the resource server. But in this case, the Spring Boot microservice one will act as both client as well as the resource server. That's why we have to add also the resource server dependencies that is the Spring Boot starter OAuth2 resource server and to enable Jose framework, the JavaScript object and signing encryption framework, we have to add the Spring Boot security OAuth2 Jose dependency. And lastly, we will enable Spring security itself inside the project. So I'm going to add Spring Boot starter security dependency. All right, now after we added all this dependency, make sure you force IntelliJ to download the dependencies and once this is done, the next step is to configure the client credentials properties inside the project. So I'm going to open application.properties file 
And in there, I'm going to copy the existing properties from the project auth to authorization code demo as the properties are going to be quite similar. So I copied the properties and I'm going to paste them into microservice one application dot properties file. So once this is done, we have to change some properties here. Obviously, we're not going to use the time leaf client uh, reference in this project. So we created a different client for that. So I'm going to replace all the usages of OAuth2 time leaf demo client with OAuth2 client credentials. And also I'm going to replace the grant type from authorization from authorization code to client credentials. And now let's also update the client secret. We still have the old client secret where we copied from the authorization code flow demo. So I'm going to open the key clock server and I'm going to open the client over to client credentials and under the client under the credentials tab, I'm going to copy the client secret, go back to IntelliJ and replace the client secret with the, the new client secret. And we also don't need any redirect URI. So I'm going to delete the property. And lastly, I'm going to add also the JSON web key set URI property as this is a resource server and need the reference to the key set to verify the JSON web token we will receive from the request. We also don't need to type this property again. We can copy the value from the backend of from the OAuth to Pixie demo project and paste it inside the microservice one project. Now I'm going to create a package called as controller and inside the package, I'm going to create a class called as controller one. As this is going to be a rest endpoint, I'm going to annotate it with rest controller annotation. And inside the controller, I'm going to create a method called as hello rest template, which returns a string from this method. And inside the method, let's return some random string value like hello. And I'm going to annotate this method with a get mapping annotation as this is going to handle the get request. And I'm going to pass in the request mapping as slash microservice one slash home. And lastly, I'm going to also define the response status also as HTTP status dot okay. Now one last thing I'm going to do is to run this application on a different port than the default 8080 port as we also have other applications running on port 8080. So I'm going to add the property server.port 8083. So by adding this property, our microservice one application will run on port 8083 and will not clash with any existing ports. And we also have to update the security configuration in our project to inform Spring Security to treat our project as a resource server and some default values which are expected from a REST backend application. There is no need to write new code here. I'm going to create a new package called config and inside the package, I'm going to create a class called as security config. Inside this class, we can just copy the code which we already wrote for Pixie demo project. So I'm going to just copy the contents inside the security config class and paste it inside the security config class of microservice one project. All right, now it's time to test our implementation. So I'm going to start the microservice one application. It should be running on port 8083 and now open the Postman client. So first we are going to make a request to the token endpoint of the authorization server with our client ID and client secret. For that, we can use the OAuth2 feature of Postman. So just open a new tab inside the Postman client and click on the authorization tab and in the dropdown named type, Make sure you select OAuth 2.0. Now on the right side, you will see some more options to fill. First of all, I'm going to select the grant type as client credentials. And in here, I'm going to provide the access token URL. We can get this information by opening our realm we created in part one of this series. I'm going to open our realm and click on the open ID configuration link. And now I'm going to copy the endpoint for token and paste it in Postman client. Next, we have to provide the client ID and client secret. I'm going to copy these details from our project and paste them into Postman. For the field scope, I'm going to leave it as open ID 
and now click on get new access token. It will take a few seconds to connect to the Keycloak authorization server and it will show us the access token and ID token it received from Keycloak. Now to use this token for our request to microservice one, you can just click on the use token button and this token will automatically be added to all our requests. So this is a nice little feature in Postman which will make us more productive or else you have to usually make a separate call to the token endpoint by preparing the request body with all the client ID, client secret and client type details we saw in the starting of the tutorial. All right, now if I click on send, you can see that we see the value hello here. So the client credential flow is working perfectly. So that's all well and good. Now, usually in a microservice environment, we don't just have one microservice. We have tens or even hundreds of microservices and as part of a use case, and as part of a use case, a request can hop and travel through multiple microservices to complete the transaction or a request. So in that case, how we can pass the token from one microservice to another microservice. For this, we can use a design pattern called as token relay. So let's understand this token relay pattern and how to implement it in your project in the next section. So when you're working on a project based on microservice architecture, generally we deal with multiple microservices which talk to each other. In this case, when we first receive the request from the user, let's say to microservice A, and if this microservice will call another microservice B, as this is also a resource server, we have to forward the access token as part of the request or else we will receive a 403 error when the request reaches microservice B. This is called as token relay pattern where we are forwarding the access token for each outgoing request for our microservice, similar to how a baton will be exchanged in a relay race. Implementing this pattern is pretty straightforward. While forwarding the request from our microservice, we have to include the access token as part of the authorization header. We can do that in Spring Boot in two ways. The first one is using the standard REST template class, which is not favored anymore by Spring Framework. And the other one is to use web client class, which is preferred alternative recommended by Spring Boot. As the support to REST template is still not deprecated, I'm going to show you both the ways of implementing token relay, including REST template and as well as web client. So to implement token relay using REST template, we can directly create an instance of REST template in our controller and use it to make requests. But we first have to implement an endpoint in microservice 2 to, to be able to call it from microservice 1. So let's go ahead and do that. Inside the pom.xml of microservice 2, I'm going to add three dependencies. These are nothing new. The first one is the resource server dependencies as the resource server dependency as the microservice 2 is going to be a resource server and this time not a client like microservice 1. And I'm going to add also the dependencies to enable Jose framework and Spring security. Man, make sure to click on the Maven icon on the top right corner of the screen if you're using IntelliJ to force IDE to download the Maven dependencies. And now let's open the application.properties file and configure it with the JSON web key set URI similar to microservice one. So we can directly copy and paste this property from microservice one application.properties file and paste it into microservice2 application.properties file. Now I'm going to create a package called as controller. And inside this package, I'm going to create a class called as controller2. I'm going to copy the controller code from controller1 class inside the microservice1 as this is going to be pretty similar. So I'm going to copy the code right from the import statement and copy it inside the controller2 class. And also I'm going to rename the class as controller2 and also the string microservice inside the get mapping as microservice2. Lastly, I'm going to add the server.port property as 8084 inside microservice2 application.properties so that it won't clash with the existing ports. All right, now we configured also microservice2 as a resource server and created the endpoints. Now we are ready to implement the token relay so I'm going to open controller one class again and create a rest template instance. I can do that by adding private final rest template equals new rest template builder dot build. This will create a new instance of rest template with default values which are enough for our use case. Now inside the method, we have to make a call to microservice two. For that, I need to first access the JOT, the JSON web token. We can retrieve this token by first checking our security context holder 
So I'm going to type security context holder dot get context dot get authentication dot get principal and cast the written type of this principal to JWT object. So now we have the JWT token. So using the REST template, I can now make a REST call to microservice2. For that, I'm going to add the token to the authorization header with a bearer scheme. For that, I'm going to first create a header. I can do that by using the HTTP headers object from the Spring framework. To this header, we need to add authorization header. So I'm going to add the key value as authorization and bearer followed by the token. So I can now retrieve the token by typing jwt.getTokenValue and now it's time to make a request to microservice2. So I can use the exchange method of the REST template to make the call. So I'm going to type REST template.exchange followed by the URL of the microservice2 endpoint followed by the HTTP method. So I'm going to add this as get followed by the HTTP entity. I'm going to create an object for this HTTP entity by providing the HTTP headers as the constructor arguments. And lastly, as the return type of this endpoint is going to be a string, I'm going to define the return type as string.class. So I can now store the response of the rest template call in a string, which is wrapped around a response entity. And I'm going to just add the return value as hello and message from microservice2 is and in here I'm going to pass on the response from the response entity by typing response.getBody. Okay, that should work now. So let's restart our microservice1 application and see how it's working. Back in the authorization type, make sure you request a new token as the token you have requested before may have already expired. And now if you make a request to the microservice1 endpoint, you should see the message hello and message from microservice2 is hello. That's perfect. Now what's remaining is to test this also with web client. For that we need to add the web flux dependency to the project. So open the pom.xml file and add the dependency spring boot starter web flux. And again, make sure to force the download of Maven dependencies by clicking on the Maven icon to the top right side corner. And inside the controller one class, I'm going to create another method called hello web client and add the get mapping annotation as microservice one slash home slash web client. And I'm also going to add the response status annotation with value as HTTP status dot okay. As we are going to return a string from this method, I'm going to also change the return type as string. And inside this method, basically I can again copy the existing code from the REST template implementation. The code to retrieve the JWT token will stay the same. And what needs to be changed is to use web client to make the request. For that, I'm going to first define an instance of web client. So I'm going to type private final web client equals web client dot builder dot build. And I'm going to store this instance of web client in a variable called web client. So back inside the hello web client method, I'm going to type web client dot get to make a get request followed by the URI, which I can copy from the rest template call. And now I have to add the bearer token as the authorization header. So I'm going to type headers and pass in the Lambda as header dot set bearer auth. And to this method call, I'm going to pass in the value jwt.getTokenValue value as an argument. So next to retrieve the response from this rest call, I'm going to add the method retrieve and in web client, if you are expecting a string object or for instance, any object, we have to denote it as mono type. So I'm going to call the method dot body to mono and pass in the type as string dot class followed by the call to the block method. This is some reactive programming syntax. I'm not going to go deep inside this because this that's a huge topic in itself. So all you need to know is whenever you are making a REST call using web client from a Spring MVC project, you have to add the block as a terminal call, which will return the response from the REST call. Okay, now we can store this written value inside a string variable called as response. And I'm going to add the message again as hello, message from microservice2 is, and append the response variable to the string. All right, now let's restart our microservice one application. All 
Okay, the application is now started and one mistake I did is uh, instead of adding microservice one, I added microservice. So I'm going to add the one again and I'm going to restart the application again so that it will be both our uh, endpoints will be similar. So the application is now started. I'm going to go back to Postman and in here I'm going to make sure that I have the correct URL here so localhost 8083 microservice one home slash web client and as it's been some time I think uh, due to short the token expiry time we have to request the access token again so I'm going to click on get new access token so the authentication is complete and we are going to get the access token back from the server so I'm going to use this token and I'm going to make a request again to the web client endpoint and here you can see hello message from microservice 2 is hello so this is using the web client to make a request to microservice 2 and this is the response we are seeing now so let's understand what is refresh token and how it works in the previous videos we saw how the authorization code flow pixie enhanced authorization code flow and client credentials flow works the common thing we can observe with all those grant types or, or authorization flows is when we request a token from the authorization server, the server will respond with an access token and a refresh token. The access token is usually short lived and will be expired after the certain time time, after a certain time limit. In those cases, we need to ask our authorization server to send us a new access token without asking the user to log in again. This is where a refresh token will help us to generate a new access token. So in a nutshell, a refresh token allows an application to request a new access token from the authorization server without asking the user to log in again. Let's have a look at it with an example. I'm going to create a new tab inside the Postman client and open the authorization tab and select the option OAuth 2.0. So I'm going to use the OAuth 2.0 option to request a new access token and a refresh token. So for that I'm going to select the grant type as authorization code so until key clock 11, we can use client credential grant to request a refresh token because that's easier to re uh, request from the from the Postman client, from the HTTP client. But from key clock 12 onwards, the refresh token is disabled by default in key for uh, disabled by default for the client credentials grant. So to request a refresh token, I'm now using the authorization code grant type. So I'm going to also provide the callback URL which is configured inside our OAuth2 demo timeleaf client. So I'm going to copy that redirect URI and paste it in the callback URL section. And I'm going to open the discovery document by going to our realm and clicking on the open ID configuration link. So here I'm going to copy both the auth URL and token URL and paste them inside the postman client. And lastly, I'm going to also provide the client ID and client secret and click on get new access token. This will open a browser window and here you have to provide your user credentials. So I'm going to type them in and once you click on login, you can see an access token inside the response which expires in 300 seconds followed by a refresh token and the expiration time of the refresh token is 1800 seconds. So let's see how to request a new access token using the refresh token. For that I'm going to open a tab inside the postman client and I'm going to make a post request again to the same token endpoint. So I'm going to first copy the URL change the HTTP method to post and inside the request body this time I'm going to add the grant type as a refresh underscore token so that our authorization server will understand that we are requesting a new access token through a refresh token. So next I'm going to use the same client ID and client secret we used previously. So I'm going to open the other tab and copy the client ID and paste it inside the request body of this new request. And let's also do the same thing for the client secret. And now finally I'm going to create a new field called as refresh underscore token. And now I'm going to and now I'm going to open the other tab again 
and copy the refresh token we received from the authorization server and I'm going to paste it here and click on send and now you can see that the server has sent us a new access token along with a new refresh token here you can see that we have the expiration time of the request token as 1800 seconds so we can also request a refresh token without an expiration time so we can do that by adding the scope called offline underscore access to the list of scopes when requesting a token so let's see how to do that back to the first tab where we requested a token using the client credentials grant type I'm going to add a new field called as scope inside the request body and provide the value for this field as open ID which is the default scope followed by offline underscore access so when I click on send now you can see that we received an access token and a refresh token but the expiration time of the refresh token is set to zero seconds that means the refresh token will never be expired I feel that having an unlimited expiration time for refresh token is not recommended because if a refresh token is stolen by a hacker the hacker can use that token to request new access tokens forever so for this reason I feel that we have to provide a longer expiration time for refresh tokens but not unlimited expiration time okay so I guess you understood how the refresh token works and how to request and how to use it to request a new access token now let's see how the password grant authorization flow works so the password grant authorization flow is another simpler grant type we have in OAuth 2 so as the name suggests we will use the password of the user along with the username to request a token so if you think about it this is what we are trying to avoid by using OAuth framework so you don't want to provide your username and password of your Google account to the photo editing application or any third party application but I guess this was still in use because maybe you want to use it for a client where you have absolute trust that means you are pretty sure that the client will not store your credentials anywhere in the database which is not really possible because you cannot have an absolute trust on a system unless you are the one who have uh, developed the system in a nutshell we should never use the password grant authorization flow but let's see how this works through a demo before we see the demonstration, we need to create a client which has a direct access grants enabled in Keycloak. So I'm going to open our realm inside our Keycloak admin console and click on clients and let's create a new client. I'm going to give the name for this client as OAuth 2 direct grant client and click on save. So we are going to make this a confidential client and make sure to disable the standard code flow and let's only enable the option direct access grant so if you hover over the question mark symbol you can see the information that this grant is used when the client wants to use the username or password of the user and this grant type is also called as resource owner password credentials grant okay now let's save this configuration and we will also get the client secret for this client so we will use this shortly now let's open the postman client again and let's open a new tab and inside the tab I'm going to make a post request to the token endpoint and for the request body I'm going to add the first request parameter as grant underscore type and which is going to be for the value password followed by the username and password of the user I created in the first part so it's going to be programming dot techie and for the password I'm going to provide the value test followed by the client ID and client secret for the client ID, I'm going to provide the value as OAuth2 direct grant client. And for the client secret, I'm going to open the browser and, and go to the Keycloak admin, admin console and copy the client secret from the client we created before. And I'm going to paste it inside the Postman client under the client secret field. Okay, that's it. Now we can send, now we can click on send. And you can see that we received an access token and a refresh token. Now you also understood how the password grant authorization flow works but don't use it ever for a production application because this is exactly what the OAuth framework is trying to avoid. So with that note let's go to the next section that is to implement single sign-on in Keycloak using the GitHub identity provider. In this section we are going to have a look at how to implement single sign-on functionality using our Keycloak identity server by using GitHub as an identity provider. I'm going to walk you through the process and how it works under the hood 
The process is pretty similar no matter which identity provider you choose. So that is either Google, Facebook or Twitter. No matter any identity provider you use, the process is similar. So single sign-on gives us the convenience of using existing accounts in the popular social media websites to log in into any application. In this way, we don't need to register in each and every application we are going to use. I believe that you may have already used this feature a lot. So let's have a look at how the flow works with the help of a diagram. So as a first step, the user will make a request to the client and the client will redirect the request to the authorization server to perform the authentication for to perform the authorization process. Now, as we already enabled single sign on using an identity provider, the authorization server will indeed forward a request to the identity provider. In our case, it's a GitHub identity server, but it can be any identity server which belongs to Facebook or even Google. Now GitHub Identity Server will receive a request and will send a login page to the user asking for the user to log in. So once the user logs into GitHub, the user should also provide his or her consent to allow the client application to use GitHub as the identity server. Once this is done, the GitHub server will generate an authorization code and will return it to the authorization server by sending the authorization code as part of the response headers. Now the authorization server will read this code and forward it to the client, which will then redirect it to the initial page, which is requested by the user. So now we saw how it works through a diagram. Now let's also see in this in action through the help, with the help of a demo. So I'm going to use an existing application as an example to demonstrate this concept. So I already enabled GitHub single sign on in my Keycloak configuration. So I'm going to open localhost 8080 slash home. This is the application we developed as part of the authorization code flow demo. So you can check it. Uh, you can check this out in part one of this tutorial series. So at first we will be greeted with a Keycloak login page. Once you open the localhost 8080 slash home uh, URL and to the right side, you can also see the sign in with GitHub option. So if I click on that button, you will now be, you will be now redirected to GitHub authorization server and GitHub will now ask us to provide our credentials and log in to their system. So let me add my credentials here. So now if I click on login, GitHub will authorize my credentials and will redirect me back to Keycloak server by adding an authorization code to the response header. So our Keycloak server will read this code and redirects to the redirect URI which is configured for this client. So by providing the authorization code which is sent by the GitHub server and the client will then redirect us to the home page of our application. So this is how the single sign on works. So let's go ahead and configure the single sign on in our Keycloak server. For that, let's open our realm OAuth2 demo realm and click on identity providers to the left side. And now you can see the drop down add identity providers in their select GitHub under the section social. So you can also see the other identity providers like Google, Facebook, Twitter, etc. So once you select GitHub, you will be redirected to an identity add identity provider page. And here we have the redirect URI, which will be used by GitHub to redirect to our Keycloak authorization server after the successful authentication and consent. So that would be the step five in the diagram we just saw a while back. Okay, and in the next fields, we need to provide client ID and client secret of our GitHub application. So for that, I should register our application in GitHub as an OAuth application. So to do that, make sure you log in to our GitHub account. So go to settings and developer settings. And in there, select OAuth apps and create a new OAuth app. And now GitHub will ask for the details of the app you are going to register. So I'm going to provide the application name as OAuth2 SSO demo. And you can provide the homepage of the app. As this is a local application, we can provide the address as localhost 8080. And lastly, we have to provide the authorization callback URL. So for that, let's open the Keycloak portal again. And we already have the redirect URI here. So we can copy this URL and paste it in the authorization callback URL section. And after that, click on register application button. Once you click on this button, it will register our application. And after a few seconds, you can see the client information like client ID. And by default, it will not create any client secret. 
we can generate a new one by clicking on generate a new client secret button and now it will ask for a password confirmation once so type in your password and click on confirm password button and now you can see the client secret generated for your application so now we can copy and paste this information into our keycloak identity provider form so both the client id as well as the client secret so once this is done click on save with this you have configured the external identity provider details in a keycloak server so and that's all we need to do to enable single sign on in our application so now i'm going to open the source code and run the authorization code demo application i'm on the master branch now as we don't need to write any code in our application to enable single sign on it's just uh, everything is configuration on the keycloak side so you can check out the link to the source code in the description section and i'm going to run the demo application.java class which will start the application at port 8080 now let me open the browser and open localhost 8080 home as we saw in the demo it will open the keycloak login page and now i'm going to click on github this will again open a login page if you are already logged in it will just ask for the consent for the first time and after a successful login you can see the home page of the application we started so that's it for this video and we also came to the end of the Spring Security OAuth 2 with Keycloak tutorial series. I hope you learned something new from this tutorial series. If you like these kinds of videos, make sure to subscribe to the channel and also share the tutorials with your friends and colleagues. So I will see you in the next tutorial. Until then, happy coding, techies.